may be seated this morning. And thank you, worship team, for leading us in the presence of the Lord. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Right. Yes, and these are the Christians, right? The week after Easter, you are here, falling more in love with Jesus. There's no other place we'd rather be, huh, than in the presence of the Lord. My name is Andrew Carroll. I'm one of the pastors here at New Life Community Church. And it is great to be here. And I think before we move forward, we just need to acknowledge and thank the Lord for everything that he did last weekend. How many of you were uh, at one of our resurrection services last weekend? It was absolutely incredible, the presence of God in that place. We had, we had seven services. We had six in English and one in Spanish. But check this out. We had 56 Hundred people come together over the course of the weekend to worship and to celebrate the Lord and his goodness and his love and the fact that you and I, we serve a God who is out of the grave. And check this out, we had 1,200 people join us online through our live stream over the course of the weekend. We had 900 kids come through. Kids that were learning that the tomb is empty so their heart doesn't have to be. Amen. And then check this out. Are you ready for this? We had 189 people say yes to Jesus last weekend. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise? He is so good. He is so worthy. I tell you that, all of that is evidence that the God we serve is alive and well, and he is moving in our midst, man. You know, I am so grateful to be a part of what God is doing here. I mean, let's just be honest. We serve one Lord, one Savior, right? And his name is Jesus, and he has one church. And at the same time, I'm so grateful and privileged to be a part of what God is doing within our community here at New Life Community Church. You know, our our senior pastors, Pastor Steve and Pastor Tammy, aren't they incredible? I mean, aren't we so blessed to have leaders that have their type of heart. You know, I've been here over the last 10 years, and there are a lot of reasons why I love them, but one of the reasons why I love them is that our pastors have a heart for God's word. We have a heart for God's word. We value the word of God. In fact, the word of God is one of the four pillars that that this church was founded on. And how many of you know that God's word is the truth? It's the whole truth. And it's nothing but the truth, right? And his word is is a gift to us today. How many of you brought the word of God, brought your Bible with you today? Yes, you brought, yes. Isn't it good to be at a church where we love God's word? Praise the Lord. Well, if you would open up with me uh, in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17. And as you're turning there, uh, allow me to catch everyone up to speed. Over the last 17 weeks, right, we started at Christmas And we carried a series all the way, culminating uh, last week as we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. We were in a 17-week series called Just Jesus. How many of you, wasn't that an incredible time? Listen, there's something about recentering our lives and making Jesus the focal point, right? We need to do that often because it's easy for us to get distracted and let other things become the priorities. But Jesus is the main thing. Would you agree, right? So today I want to announce that we are going to start uh, another series called Just Jesus Part 2. 34 weeks. Ah, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, 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 no. Listen, we have been in the New Testament. So this morning we're going to go a little Old Testament on you. Is that okay? Right? And we're going to do a a two-week series this week and next week. And the series title is called Pivotal Choices. How many of you would agree that the choices that you make in your life, the choices matter? Right? Yes, yes. And how many of you would also agree that, listen, knowledge comes through learning, but wisdom comes through living. There's some things you can only learn and grasp by having lived through that season in your lives, right? And and, and sometimes you just gotta live through the season. And this is why I appreciate God's word. Because this is a book of wisdom. This is a book where you and I can come and we can learn the lessons of those that have gone before us. So in this two week series, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at the lessons from the kings, right? How many of you know that the people of Israel, they they, they had these kings in in their history? 
And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the first king and we're going to look at the last king. And we're going to learn lessons from their lives. And can anybody guess on what, what king we're going to talk about today? Is it going to be the first or the last? What? First or last? Okay, it's going to be the last. You don't want to know why? Because the Bible says the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Amen? So it's biblical, right? But uh, that's what we're going to talk about in 2 Kings chapter 17. Now, the other thing i got to let you know before we open up God's Word is I just got a new Bible. I'm so excited about my Bible. And I got, I got bigger font. You know? I did. You know, my other Bible, it was falling apart where I could literally take the, the middle portion. I could take it out of it. And at that point, I was like, okay, I, I, might, I might need something. You know, and it's like that song, right? I like big Bibles and I cannot lie, right? <laughs> right? We love God's word. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the chapter we're going to talk about is 41 verses. We're going to read most of it. Now, here's the other thing I want to let you know. Some of you, in January, you told the Lord that you were going to commit to reading your Bible more often. Some of you maybe didn't keep up that commitment to the Lord. We're going to cover 41 verses. We're going to catch all of you up today. Are you ready for that? Right? So would you stand with me? Would you stand with me? We're going to look at 2 Kings chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 7. And this is what the word of the Lord says. Verse 7, it says, All this took place because Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt from under the power of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. They worshipped other gods and they followed the practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. From watchtower to fortified city, they built themselves high places in all their towns. They set up sacred stones and asher poles on every high hill and, ever, and under every spreading tree. At every high place they burned incense as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. They did wicked things that aroused the Lord's anger. They worshiped idols, though the Lord had said, you shall not do this. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all of his prophets and seers. They said, turn from your evil ways. Observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I've commanded your ancestors to obey and that I delivered to you through my servants, the prophets. Verse 14, here's what Israel did, but, but they would not listen and they were as stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their ancestors and the statutes he had warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and they themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do. They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and they made for themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves and, and Asherah pole. They bowed down to all the starry hosts and they worshiped Baal. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters in the fire. They practiced divination and they sought omens and they sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. Verse 18, so the Lord was very angry with Israel and he removed them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left and even Judah did not keep the commands of the Lord their God. They followed the practices of, that Israel had introduced. Therefore the Lord rejected all the people of Israel. He afflicted them and gave them into the hands of plunderers until he thrust them in uh, from his presence. Verse 21, when he tore Israel away from the house of David, they made Jeroboam, son of Nebat, their king. Jeroboam enticed Israel away from following the Lord and he caused them to commit a great sin. The Israelites persisted in all the sins of Jeroboam and they did not turn away from them, verse 23, until the Lord removed them from his presence as he had warned them through the prophets, his servants. So the people of Israel were taken from their homeland and into exile in Assyria, and they were still there. Verse 24, the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon and a lot of other places, verse 25. You like that? 
You know, just because the, the print on my Bible is bigger doesn't mean I know how to pronounce the words that are, that are in it. Verse 25, when they lived there, they did not worship the Lord, so he sent lions among them and killed some of the people. This is crazy. There's like a zoo outbreak going on. And it was reported to the king of Assyria that the people you deported and resettled in the towns of Samaria, they do not know what the God of the country requires. He has sent lions among them which are killing them off because the people do not know what the Lord requires. The king of Assyria gave this order. He said, have one of the priests you took captive from Samaria go back to live there and teach the people what the God of the land requires. So one of the priests who had been exiled from Samaria came to live in Bethel and he taught them how to worship the Lord. I want you to go down to verse 34. Verse 34, it says, to this day, they persist in the former practices. They neither worship the Lord nor adhere to his decrees and regulations. The laws and the commands that the Lord gave the descendants of Jacob, whom he named Israel. When the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites, he commanded them, do not worship any other gods or bow down to them, serve or sacrifice to them. But the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt with his mighty power and his outstretched arm, he is the one you must worship. To him you shall bow down and to him offer sacrifices. You must always be careful to keep the decrees and regulations, the laws and the commands that he wrote for you. Do not worship other gods and do not forget the covenant I have made with you and do not worship other gods, rather worship the Lord your God. It is he who will deliver you from the hand of all your enemies. Verse 40, yet they would not listen. However, but they persisted in their former practices, even while these people were worshiping the Lord, they were serving their idols. To this day, their children and their grandchildren continue to do as their ancestors did. Would you pray with me? Father, we pray today that as we walk through your word, that you would speak to us in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Some of you are like, man, that is more scripture than I've read in all year. Well, that, that is a good thing. You know, here's what's interesting. In this series, this two-week series called Pivotal Choices, the title of the message today is Why Everything Fell Apart, <laughs> which I absolutely love that title. Do you know why? Because last week was Easter, and last week we talked about God's unfailing love and his undying hope, Right? Last week we talked about when all is lost, right? Death doesn't have the last word. Jesus has the last word, right? And he's overcome sin, the death, and the grave. There, there, there's this hope that wells up. And then the week after Easter, we're going to talk about why everything fell apart in the first place, right? Right? Last week we talked about hope. This week we're going to talk about why the world was hopeless and in need of hope. And I'll tell you this. We're going to talk about a storyline of how things fell apart. And here's the reason why. Because you know people in your life that don't serve the Lord. You know people in your life and your friends and in your family, people you work with, that they're in need of Jesus. And as we see the storyline unfold of how things fell apart, you and I are gonna be able to know how to bring hope to those that feel hopeless in this season, right? So let me begin by asking this question. Has anybody in the room ever been in a, a car accident? Raise your hand. Okay, I am in good company. In my years of driving, I have been in a few car accidents. Most of which I just wanna go on record saying I don't think were my fault. But over the years, I, I've actually hit a lot of things. I, I've hit curbs, I've hit fences, I've hit mailboxes, I've hit cars, I've hit motorcycles, I've hit bicyclists, but that one was a little shady because whose fault it was was neither here nor there. I was 17 years old and the pastor at the time in Sacramento, he let me drive the church van, which I have no idea why he let me drive the church van. And on the side of our church van, we had these big letters in red that said, Jesus saves. <laughs> Amen. So I'm driving down Broadway in, uh, in uh, Sacramento and I make a right-hand turn. I'm already turning. And then 
all of a sudden, a second later, I hear this, boom. And all of a sudden, I hear this guy on a bike go, hey, right? And he ran right into Jesus. Like, it was just, you know, there he was. To which, you know, I believe this. I, I think he was under the influence. I'm not sure because I didn't stick around. I just kept on course. Um, true story. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Okay, okay, isn't it, there's something about being in church, you just got to bring things out, you know what I mean? It felt so good to let that, I've been carrying that for years, right? But, you know, I just believe that one day there's going to be this evangelist that's going to be speaking to millions, and he's going to say, you know what? I was riding my bike on Broadway in the streets of Sacramento, <laughs> running away from God, and God just got my attention. And I looked, and then Jesus saves as it drove by. But needless to say, so in all of my experiences, this is, this is one observation. When you get in a car accident, things happen quick. It happens fast, right? You, you, you turn your eyes or, or whatever, and in a moment things can change. So I want to show you a video, and it has to do with a car crash, and it's going to offer two perspectives. And this video is going to show you and I how to understand 2 Kings chapter 17. Are you ready? All right, let's go ahead and watch this video. Three, two, one, go! Keep it on the K-Rail. This is great! He's booking. Come on. He's booking. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Oh! 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 oh my. That is Wait. not bad. That is almost dead on. Oh! Oh, the wheel moves on the left-hand yeah. side one. Look, the back wheels are oh, off the floor. Look at that melon coming out. <laughs> So the back car, look at how high off the ground the back, the right hand side car is. It's just taken off. That's great. Ooh. Look at the front oh. wheel there, just gets oh. smushed and then all these melons go the flying. <laughs> oh. oh, and the melons pushed loads of shards of glass out. Wait, so it wasn't even the crash that smashed the glass, it was the melons hitting the glass that smashed it. You would not want to be in there. No, you I'm would. glad no one was. Two perspectives. The first perspective was real time. The second perspective was the accident slowed down. And how many of you know when you slow it down, you notice a lot of details that you didn't see in the first take, right? Here's what happens. Second, uh, Second Kings 17 slows down the story of how Israel fell. Israel was a nation and they belonged to the Lord. And their role was to be a light to the nations around them. They were supposed to reflect the Lord and especially the kings of Israel. The kings of Israel was supposed to be a visible representation of Yahweh. You know, but there was a moment when everything fell. You know, I have a daughter and when she was three, she was afraid of the dark. I also have a friend named Jimmy who's 33 and he's still afraid of the dark. But here's what I've noticed. When you're in a dark room and you have a small light, that small light lights up the whole room. But when that light goes out, darkness invades and it comes in. 2 Kings 17 is the light being blown out. It's the story of how Israel fell. And in the story, as we slow it down, we're going to notice three things. Are you ready? If you're taking notes, I want you to write these three things down. The first thing that we notice in the story is, number one, we notice Israel's sin. Israel's sin. And what I want to do is I want to kind of walk back through the story and highlight some of the verses that, that we looked at. In verse chapter 7 and 8, this is what the scripture says. That all this, right, what's all this? The fact that the nation got captured by the Assyrians and deported, right? Right? So the, the towns and the buildings, there's rubble everywhere. And when you're in that situation, when everything is falling apart, the question is, hey, why did everything fall apart? Here's what it says in verse 7. That all this took place because Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God. All because of their sin. Now, I want to tell you a story about a man named Joe. 
uh, about 12 years ago, my wife was in a, uh, a program, a scholarship program, where there was about 15 of them. And each year they would take a group of uh, about 15 students and they gave them a full ride scholarship to receive a Master's of Divinity. But you had to finish it in three years. So there was a young man named Joe who, who was part of this group of students. So for three years, they, they studied the Bible, they, they learned, they, they grew. And about a year and a half in, Joe began to have questions. And maybe you have had some of the questions that Joe had. Questions like, why in the world was the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Right? Have you ever wondered that? Like, if we could go back and change one thing in the story, like, let's go back in time, take a chainsaw, and cut down that tree, right? Because then they're not going to be picking the fruit off the tree if the tree's not there. Or how about this one? Can we go back to the garden and make sure that there's no snakes in the garden first? Like, that would be helpful, right? And, and the questions in his mind were, what kind of God says, hey, don't eat this fruit, they ate fruit, and the result was you're gonna be removed from my presence and you're gonna spend eternity in hell. Like, is God only concerned about our behavior? Is God only concerned about us getting every single detail right, and if we miss one thing, then the answer is that he removes us and we are internally separated from him. Can you imagine if we did that to our children, right? You have a four-year-old and there's a cookie jar. Do not take the cookie out of the cookie jar. They take the cookie out of the cookie jar. All right, you're gone. I know you're four. Take your door a backpack and get out of the house, <laughs> right? You do not belong here, right? So what does this tell us about God? Or could it be, could it be that there's something else that's happening underneath the surface that we don't see? I'll tell you this. Sin doesn't begin at the surface. The seeds of sin begin in our hearts. And in verse 7, it said they sinned against the Lord. And then at the end of that verse, it says what that disobedience was. That they worshipped other gods. They worshipped other gods. So the first question in regards to sin is not how will you live. The first question in regards to sin is who will you love. That before they turned away with their actions, there was a turning away of their hearts, right? But then in the sin, there was this damage that was unleashed, right? Look at what it says in verse 15. It says that the Israelites, they followed worthless idols and they themselves became worthless. Why? Because here's what it means to be human. Are you ready? You and I reflect what we worship. You and I were created in the image of God to reflect his love, to reflect his light. But when we worship things other than God, that's what we reflect. And if the gods that we worship are worthless, then we ourselves will become worthless. But listen, the damage that it causes doesn't end with us. It reflects out. Look at what it says in verse 17. In verse 17 because they worshiped other gods and they were becoming like those other gods. In verse 17, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters in the fire. They got to the point where they were taking their children to the altar, to these worthless gods, right? Unbelievable sin, unimaginable. Little children sacrificing. How did they get to that place? It began in their hearts when they began worshiping other gods. So how does this play out in our lives? How do we make sense and understand it? To help us understand, I want to invite four of my favorite sinners to the stage. Let's give them a hand. Well, actually, one of them is going to represent Jesus, and then the other three are sinners. So, But there's great. But we've got to understand how this plays out in our life. And here's why. The story of Israel is the story of all of us, and it's also the story of each of us. And here, here's what I mean. Here's what Israel did. See, when you and I, we were made in the image of God, we were created to reflect the Lord. We were image bearers. We were a two-way mirror. And what happens is whatever is at this place of worship in our life, whatever is in the center, whatever we are worshiping, that's what we're reflecting. 
So when, when the Lord is at the center, that's what we reflect. So the Lord who is loving and kind and gracious and good, when he's at the center and we're worshiping him, then we become like the Lord and our life is shaped and characterized and marked by his love and his goodness and his justice and his kindness. But what happens when something else is sitting at the seat? You guys know the story of Adam and Eve, right? And you know the story of in Genesis chapter 1. What did God say after every day that he, uh, he created something? What did he say? It was, it was good, right? It was good, it was good, it was good. On the seventh day, it was very good. And then in Genesis chapter 2, God saw man, he saw Adam by himself. And what did he say about that? He said, this is not good, right? <laughs> we got to get Eve on the scene. This, this is not good. So in Genesis 1 and 2, who is the one that's defining good and evil? It's God. And then we see a tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, that tree represents a choice. Will you and I redefine good and evil for ourselves? Or will we trust our creator's definition of good and evil? We were created to worship him, but to rule over the earth, right? So in Genesis chapter 3, I believe it's in verse 5, it says that Adam and Eve, they saw that the fruit was pleasing to the eye, that it was good for attaining wisdom. And they reached out and they seized it and they bit but that happens in verse 5. What happens in verses 1 through 4? They, they're having a conversation. Do you know who they're talking to? Who are they talking to? They're talking to the snake. That serpent, right? And what happens? The serpent is described in two characteristics. Number one, the serpent was crafty. Crappy, crafty, kind of <laughs> the same. But number two, number two, the serpent was described as one of the beasts of the field, right? And as humans, they were called to rule over the beasts of the field, right? So let's pretend that this young man is the creator and this is the snake. All right, let's have you guys switch places. This is exactly what happened with Adam and Eve. Rather than listening their, to their creator... They listened to a creature. They were supposed to rule over the creature. But now they gave it a seat that it was never supposed to sit in. And because they worshipped or they listened to this beast of the field, they themselves became beast-like. In Genesis chapter 4, when it talks about Cain and Abel, and Cain wants to kill his brother. And if you have brothers, there's always a time in our lives where we want to kill our brothers. Amen? Okay, I didn't get really... Too many amens. I have two brothers, and if you're watching this, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but what does it say about Cain, right? That sin is crouching at the door. and it, So sin is personified as this beastly desire that wants to overtake. And Cain opens the door, and he allows that beastly desire. He becomes like what they worship, right? Okay, let's have you guys switch back. So in our day, we, we may not have gods like Bel and Asherah and all these gods. But here, here are a few different names. How about this one? Money, sex, power, right? Money, sex, and power. Here's what happens in our lives. Now, money, sex, and power by themselves, those are not bad things, right? It's not bad things to be able to have money and to be able to be generous, right? And can I talk to all the married people in the room? Sex, not a bad thing. Can I get an amen? amen. Right? You are participating in the ongoing creation of the world, right? Power, the ability to make a difference, not a bad thing, right? But here's what happens, right? Let's pretend, let's pretend this guy's money over here, right? So let's have money and Jesus take a different seat. What happens is when money becomes our first priority, that's what we reflect. You guys see that? And then our life becomes all about making more money all about having more possessions. It's not as if this in and of itself is bad, but it's in the wrong place. It needs to be Jesus to come back on the throne and money needs to go back. Do you see what I'm saying? So as long as Jesus is at the center, everything else is in its proper place. But do you know what we do in our culture? We want Jesus to be our savior. We don't want Jesus to be our Lord. 
So we take Jesus, Jesus get up, and we say we're going to take the seat ourselves. We want to sit in the driving seat of our lives, right? We want God to be our Savior and clean up our mess, but we don't want him to be our Lord. So we have to submit to how he wants us to live, right? But it doesn't work that way. As humans, sit down, brother. As humans, we are created to reflect what we worship. Here's another way to say it. Instead of idols, think of it as priorities. Our priorities will shape us and they will shape the world around us. So I wonder how many people in this room, you have good priorities in your life. Family, finances, working hard, all of these things, right? They're good priorities. But are they the driver of your life? Because I will tell you this, unless Jesus is driving, you're gonna crash. Amen. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. So this is exactly what Israel happened, right? They worshiped other idols. They themselves became wor uh, worthless, like the idols they worshiped. And then there was this unleashing of hell in the world around them. So look at what it says in verse 18. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and he removed them from his presence, which I thought to myself, really, Lord? Like, that's your first response? Like your children, your people are having a problem and your first thought is, well, I'm just gonna kick you out, right? Why does the Lord do this, right? And this is where we enter the second part of the story. The first part was Israel's sin. The second part is Israel's exile, right? Israel's exile, if you're taking notes, the first one is Israel's sin. And secondly, Israel's exile. And what does it mean to be exiled? It means to be removed from the presence of God, right? I want you to notice a few things that we see in the story as it unfolds. Are you ready? The question first becomes, why did God do this? Let's go to the, uh, the next verse. This is verse 22, by the way. That the Israelites persisted in all the sins of Jeroboam, and they did not turn away from them until the Lord removed them from his presence. Until, listen, the people of Israel were not going to stop in their ways until they felt removed from the presence of God. A lot of times we try to deal uh, with problems on the surface level, right? Like imagine your toilet overflowing, right? Not a good thing. You can grab the mop and start mopping it. But the first thing you need to do is you need to turn off the water so that more doesn't come out, right? A lot of times... When we deal with situations, we are always, our first reaction is to grab the mop. But God gets to the root and he knows that the only way is to remove them from his presence, right? Let's go back to the story of Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve uh, ate from the tree, the first thing that God did is he removed them from his presence. Why? Because he didn't want them to have access to the tree of life and continue living in a state of disobedience and disconnection from the Lord, right? So there was this removal. Now here's what happens when this removal takes place. This is so crazy. Go to the next, uh, the next verse, right? When they first lived there, they did not worship the Lord. So here's what the Lord did. He sent lions among them and they killed some of the people, right? So, so they didn't worship the Lord. So God's idea is like, hey, let's send some lions. And let's let them have lunch, right? How many of you would agree that that is a difficult day, right? Imagine going home that day. Yeah, you know, work was a little bit crazy. You know, my coworker got ate by a lion. Like, you know, like it was just a rough day out there, right? It was difficult. But as the story unfolds, this difficulty creates an opportunity for something, right? Let's go to the next, next verse we see. It says, then the king of Assyria gave this order, have one of the priests that you took captive from Samaria go back to live there and teach the people what the God of the land requires. So good. In their exile, in their being removed from the Lord, the Lord sent difficulty and that difficulty provided an opportunity for them to learn how to worship and how to love the Lord their God. Right? Right? And this is what we learn, that even though the people of Israel were removed from God's presence, they still remained in his love. Here's the storyline. Let's, let's look at the storyline real quick. We see sin. They chose to 
to worship other things, right? And they refuse the Lord. And what, what that led to is difficulty. How many of you in this room, that was there a season in your life where you walked away from the Lord? Raise your hand. All right, for those of you that have your hands raised, how many would you say that in that season some difficult things happened, right? Amen. Yes. When we walk away from God, difficult things happen. And by the way, even when we walk with the Lord, difficult things happen. The difference is we understand how close he is in those seasons, right? So after that difficulty, it creates an opportunity. An op the priest came to the people that were in exile. Jesus came to humanity that was lost in the wilderness, right? And he tabernacled among them. And in each and every one of our lives, in those difficult times when we're walking away from Jesus, the Lord will always, in our exile, he will send echoes of his love. And he'll remind us who he is, right? And here's what happens. You have a choice. But what happens if you still choose to reject the Lord? Go to the next slide. You see the story. The storyline just continues. Here's how it works. You sin, you turn away from the Lord, right? And then secondly, things become difficult. And in that difficulty, thirdly, there's an opportunity for you to, to learn about God. And then you're left with a choice. But if you choose to continue in your ways, then life will become more difficult. And in that difficulty, there will be an opportunity. And in that opportunity, you will be confronted with a choice to continue or to return to the Lord. And if you choose to continue in your sin, life will get difficult. And in that difficulty, there will be an opportunity. And in that opportunity, there will be a choice for you to return to the Lord. The story just continues. Continues. We see Israel's sin, we see Israel's exile, and we see Israel's choice. What was their choice? Look at what it says in verses 40 and 41. It says, they would not listen, but they persisted in their former practices. Even while these people were worshiping the Lord, they were serving their idols. To this day, their children and grandchildren continue to do as their ancestors did. Their choices not only affected them, but it affected those who followed in their footsteps. How did Israel get to the place where everything fell apart? What choices were made long ago that shaped the circumstances they found themselves in? I wanna go back to verse eight real quick. In verse eight, it says this. It says that they worshiped other gods and they followed the practices of the nations. But listen to the last line. As well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. What choices did they make? What did they introduce? Do you guys want to know? Do you guys want to know? Okay, you're going to have to come back next week when we talk about the first king. But I'll tell you this. This is the storyline of how everything falls apart. And this is why it matters for you. See, we just celebrated Easter and we have hope. So we're going to walk into a world where people are worshiping things other than the Lord. And as a result, they're damaging themselves and they're damaging the world around them and they feel removed from the presence of God and that life is gonna be difficult, but in that difficulty, there's gonna be an opportunity. So here's how you guys play a part, are you ready? You guys are called to bring that choice to people in their difficulty, that in their moments of hopelessness that we can offer the hope that Easter brings, right? That's the part we get to play in the story. <laughs> because we reflect what we worship. So as we close, would you stand with me today? There's two things I wanna make mention of. First, those of you in this room who've made a choice to make Jesus the Lord of your life, but you've never been water baptized, in the wedge room to my right, your left, we're gonna have a water baptism informational meeting because next week we're having a water baptism service. If you are one of the 189 that gave your life to the Lord last week and you're new to the church, we want to get to know you. We have a special meet and greet in room seven, which is right across these back doors. And we would love to get to know you more. But for everybody else in the room, listen to this. May you realize that you reflect what you worship. May you realize that your loved ones that 
seem removed from the Lord, they still remain in his love. And may you understand that you have a choice to step into their lives and offer the choice of hope that can make all the difference in the world. The Lord wants to use you. So in response, let's worship the Lord as we close today.